We're here today at Hope in Barnoldswick to see the new HBT track bike designed for the GB Olympic team at the Tokyo Olympics in 2020. With me, I have Sam Pendred, who is a uh, design engineer who is heavily involved in the design of this bike, and hopefully he's going to tell us a few things about it. So I think the first thing that everyone probably notices when they see the bike is obviously the radical fork and seat stays design. Can you tell us a little bit about why it's been designed that way? Yeah, so the whole idea behind this bike is designing an aerodynamic package instead of just an aerodynamic bike. So the whole theory behind this is the rider incorporated within the design of this allowed a different way of thinking about how the bike could actually be designed to aid the rider. So instead of having what is conventionally narrow seat stays, narrow forks to try and reduce the frontal air of the bike, we've actually managed to look at the rider on the bike and place the seat stays and forks in different areas to aid the rider. And it's all based around the rider's legs and how the fork interact with the rider's legs and also the seat stay with the legs as well. Okay, so, so the fork is sort of, and, and it's in the kind of line of the pedals, is that right? Yeah, if you take a frontal view of the bike with a rider on it, you can actually see that the forks align with the rider's legs. Okay. Uh, so the air can actually be deflected uh, effectively around the rider's legs, which improves aerodynamics. With the forks as well, is there a kind of stiffness benefit from having this wider leg placement as well? Well, obviously we want them to be as stiff as possible, but the primary function of the forks is for the aerodynamics, but it's shown as, as well with the rider feedback as well that the front end does feel very stiff. And it's more so to do with the actual shaping of the forks and the fact that they're wider will actually help the stiffness of the forks anyway. So it's almost a win-win really. So is this, so this is a bike for all types of riders, so sprinters, Madison, yeah, yeah. pursuiters? Yeah, so the bike uh, can be changed from a sprint setup as we have here to a pursuit setup as well with the change of the forks and the bars. So we've, yeah, we've had people testing it in both pursuit and sprint setups as well, but it's aimed to be used by all the, all the different disciplines. So as part of the design process for this bike, Hope have created a new disc wheel which used a revolutionary manufacturing process, according to Hope, uh, to make a disc wheel that is just as stiff as a regular one, but perhaps substantially lighter, is that right? Yeah, that was, that was the aim of the project. Uh, and we looked at a variety of different ways to essentially try and make the wheel in one, because we've got the capability to machine our own moulds here and, and we, everything's done in-house. So we always try and make things as easy as we possibly can for ourselves to get a finished product straight out of the mould. When we saw the conventional method of producing disc wheels, you essentially have to glue one disc to the other and then you've got centre tubes and rims to contend with as well. So we tried to develop a way where we can do this all in one and through a specific bagging process we've managed to developed manufacturing process where a full uh, disc wheel with the hollow structure out of the mould in one continuous piece so the rim, the two disc and the centre tube is actually formed from one continuous piece of carbon. This has allowed us to reduce the weight of the wheel, specifically the weight comes out of the areas where you'd have to actually bond the pieces together and using significant amounts of adhesive this does actually add up to quite a lot when you're talking about wheels that are, are very light in the first place anyway. Okay, let's talk a bit more about the frame. Now, Hope have recently started making their own mountain bikes and that has meant that they have built up an expertise in carbon manufacturing and you, you guys make your own moulds, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, so one of the biggest factors for actually producing a carbon frame is, is getting the mould created. So the fact that uh, we machine a lot of aluminium here it allows us to readily and easily manufacture our moulds in-house and we can use these for prototyping because we can machine them within a week or two so we can actually use them to develop a full carbon prototype and then from that point we can make changes to the mould and we can, once we're happy, we can machine up our final moulds. We've actually made five different moulds for this bike here. We actually have 
modular pieces that you can change in and out of the mould. So we've got five main different sizes, but we can actually get eight different frame variants from these moulds. So the fact that we can machine these ourselves opens a lot more opportunities for developing and manufacturing our own carbon frames. And now you might think that you know, carbon fibre is you know, sort of made by machines and things like that, but actually all carbon fibre bikes, because they're, it's a carbon layup, is actually laid down by hand, isn't yeah. it? It's a completely handmade process. So, so every kind of carbon frame is a completely handmade product in yeah. reality. Yeah, well this frame here has actually taken us about two men, two full days really, to actually lay all the pieces. I think there's, there's over 300 pieces that go into, into one frame and that's excluding the seat stays. So uh, there's a lot of work that goes in and they all have to be laid in in a specific place and it's all done by hand. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of care and time that goes into actually producing one of these frames. And I think a bit like your mountain bike frames, it doesn't look like you've kind of put any kind of paint on top of it. And is that because you're kind of you're proud of the quality of your workmanship and therefore you want to show off the kind of carbon yeah. layup underneath? There's a few factors to why, why that's the case and I mean the specific reason for like the 130 is, is definitely you can see the craftsmanship that's gone into it and the quality that we take pride in, we want, we want to show that off um, and we're doing that with this as well but the other factor of this is, is weight is obviously a big thing and paint on top of that can add a significant amount of weight. Now I'm sure one question you'll all be wondering about is, you know, how can I buy one? So the frame and the wheels, as well as a complete package, will be available before the end of December this year. Uh, so we'll be selling that directly here from Hope. It's all on a made-to-order basis, so anybody who is interested will have to contact us and uh, we can take it from there. So, you know, start writing those Christmas lists up. You might not be able to get it just in time for Christmas, but certainly, they will be ready for the next racing season. We spoke to uh, Ian Weverell, your uh, MD earlier, and he said that you were also thinking about developing a uh, road version, potentially a TT bike of this frame. What would you change about that, do you think? Is there any design implications? I hear it might be a disc brake bike. Well, I mean, coming from us, I think it would be uh, definitely relevant to have a disc brake version of this, but it's a logical step from the aerodynamic benefits of this to transfer that over into something like a like a time trial bike and uh, I think all of us being keen riders here anyway we're we're excited to see that develop and we're we're thinking of putting some work in to actually make that a reality. Okay so that's maybe a watch this space on that one. Uh, one more interesting detail is this apparently is uh, Bradley Wiggins saddle that he used to break the world hour record so how, how has this ended up here? Well, it, it just so happened that one of the mechanics for British Cycling uh, does a lot of riding himself, so he has inherited this saddle somehow from that, and he uses this at the minute, so when we needed the saddle quickly to, to, to chuck on the bike, it ended up being that one. And it, yeah, it just so happens that it was Brad Wiggins, our record saddle, so yeah, a little cool fact. <laughs> You also might be wondering, you know, how big is that chain ring? It looks pretty huge. Yeah, I mean, I was impressed that they could turn that when we went to go to see the testing, but I believe it's a 64 tooth chain ring on the front there, so they've, they've put some serious power through it to be able to turn that. A big thing with the wheels, obviously, usually is that designers try and manufacture their frames around a certain set of wheels. Is that the case with this bike? I think the interesting thing with the design of this frame is because you've got such wide forks and seat stays for the aerodynamic advantage around the rider's legs, it actually opens up a, a new avenue because you've not got the effect of the relationship between the wheel and the forks and the wheels and the seat stays. You're almost taken away from having to integrate them together and it, you've just got a lot more opportunity to do different things without having to worry about integrating them. It's an exciting point that could be developed further and it's, it's definitely something that's been looked into when the wheels have been designed. Now many of you will obviously recognise the Lotus name on the fork and so Lotus made the fork and handlebar arrangement, is that right? Yes, yeah, so we took care of the wheel and frame design and then Lotus were involved with Renishaw uh, to manufacture the, the fork and the handlebar design so 
They're, like you said, 3D printed titanium bars that Renishaw have done and then Lotus and Renishaw have collaborated to produce that unit to, to integrate with the frame and wheels that, that we've manufactured. And is the advantage of using 3D printed parts is that they have a higher strength to rate, weight ratio than, say, a composite handlebar? The advantage of using 3D printed is you've, you've got a lot more flexibility about design. For example, within certain parts that you couldn't have internal structure, like a carbon fibre part, say, you can actually place this internal structure within, within the 3D printed titanium pieces and you can use that to your advantage to reduce wall sections in other areas. So with a lot, a lot of thinking, you can actually design a better part and you've got the flexibility of not being restricted to one mould. So there's a lot less restrictions that you would normally have uh, from a mould that's been machined. So. And one thing that we've noticed on this bike and that was on the press release pictures is the sort of split stem design that is a bit reminiscent of a Cervelo S5 but I think that might, that might be changing, is that correct? Yeah, unfortunately this has been deemed illegal by the UCI, so this uh, is currently on our show bike at the minute uh, because the other one's being ridden, so the actual design has, has changed on that. I've noticed that the saddle to bar drop on this bike is, you know, is frankly ridiculous, so can you tell us why that is? Yeah, so, the riders are obviously always striving to be in the most aerodynamic position they can, so the actual top tube and, and the head tube area on this bike has been massively reduced to, say, a conventional bike, and it's, uh, it's resulted in a very low and long frame to allow the riders to get in the positions that they desire. In terms of the actual carbon layup, it's quite difficult to tell from the outside what makes a carbon bike so special, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the process of laying up, what type of carbon fibre do you use? Yeah, so this bike predominantly, it's about 90% high modulus fibres, so a lot of the time high modulus frames where it's stated, there may be a few pieces in there, but yeah, as I say, 90% of this bike has been made from the high modulus fibres to effectively give us the best chance of the stiffest, lightest bike we can make. And then the woven aspects of it are used in areas that are a lot more complex, such as the bottom bracket and the head tube, because there's a lot of different forces that go through this in different directions. So to be able to achieve the design requirements in that area, we can use different fibres for different reasons. But, but yeah, we've used predominantly unidirectional high modulus fibres to provide the stiffest, lightest bike we can. And is there a performance advantage to using high modulus carbon fibre? Why doesn't, why doesn't everyone use it? Well, the main reason is predominantly cost and the actual skill of laying that specific material up uh, is a lot harder just because of the nature of the material before it's cured. There's, there's a lot more skill and time that has to actually go into using that material in there. But yeah, it's about five times the cost of your standard modulus fibres as well, so it's it's a very high performance, but there's a lot more work that goes that goes into actually achieving that. So I know this bike is all about aerodynamics, but how much does it weigh? So we've obviously worked as well as we can to reduce the weight because obviously it's a it's a massive factor to performance as well. So we're we're currently at about 7.5 kilos for this current build, but there's still a lot of work that's going into development in areas such as the wheels and the bars to actually reduce weight. So we're hoping to, to bring that down. That was the Hope HBT track bike. Do you want to see a row version of this bike? Will you be buying one when they're released on the 1st of January 2020? Let us know what you think about it in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that little bell icon so that you get a notification every time we upload a video. Thank you.